and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. No doubt, the emerging church is on the rise in our day. Its tentacles of compromise are reaching far and wide over the so-called music industry. In this documentary, By the Grace of God, I plan to expose the diabolic schemes of the devil and his hidden agenda that is now surfacing while he is beginning to show his hand because he knows he has but a short time. As John said, Antichrists were at work in his day, and clearly more than ever before, they are at work in ours. Pope Francis seems to be the ecumenical cornerstone that everything else is built upon. He is like the keystone that holds everything together. The people who are coming under this banner of unity have let their guard down of contending for any objective truth. They have yielded to a spineless message of promoting false peace. Like the old saying goes, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. And these artists are dropping like flies. Their conformity to pop culture or to whatever is trendy knows no bounds. They seem to be linking up with one agenda in mind. Their zeal and momentum is not for truth but for popularity and prestige. Not for the honor of God and for His name, but for their own honor and to promote their name. Some of these artists seem to be a mere evangelistic tool or extension of their denomination or organization. You could say they are the mascots to rally the troops and rake in the money. You see this with Elevation, Hillsong, Passion City, and Bethel Music. It's a you scratch my back, I will scratch yours, or should I say, you stroke my ego, I stroke yours type of network. They are bridge builders of compromise in order to expand their influence of fame, and they have no problem using each other's fame as a springboard to obtain greater fame. In short, they are trying to serve their dream and God as well. And Jesus clearly said, you cannot serve two masters. Paul says, if I seek to please men, I cease from being a servant of Christ. They are throwing caution to the wind 
blurring the lines of truth in order to please themselves and for their popularity among men. Therefore, they have ceased from serving God. That is, if they were ever really serving him in the first place. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in this so-called Christian music industry, emphasis on so-called, the artists seem to be grabbing for it hand over fist. While secular music has the American Music Awards, Christian music has the Dove Awards. They are essentially the same at heart, and for some time they've been merging together. They have even gone as far as giving Grammys to the artists of the Christian music industry. Some may ask, are you saying that all the singers in this corporation are not of God? No, I don't know the heart of every person. Yet I will say this, anyone who loves God and is truly saved would swiftly be seeking to exit the industry after learning of its corruption. The Bible says evil company corrupts good habit. It says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And yet it also says come out from among them and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Many of these artists are multi-millionaires, and it would most likely bore you if I went through the entire list. Just to name a few, Amy Grant, a multi-Grammy award-winning American singer and songwriter, has a net worth of 55 million. Michael W. Smith, her partner in crime, has a net worth of 14 million. We also have Toby Mac coming in with a net worth of 10 million. Not to mention John Cooper, the lead singer and bassist of the Christian rock band Skillet, who has a net worth of 12 million. Kurt Franklin at 8.5 million. Jeremy Camp at 8 million. Then we have Hillsong and Elevation Worship's net worth that are unknown, but they predict it to be as high as 11 million for each of them, and so on and so on. Some might say, what's wrong with this? Should they not get paid for their talent? To answer this, I would say, receiving a love offering and charging a hefty price for your music or live concerts are two entirely different things. The Bible talks about living from the gospel, meeting the necessities of the minister, not living high on the hog as some of these artists are doing. What did Jesus tell his disciples when he sent them out for ministry? He said, provide neither gold nor silver, nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs for a worker is worthy of his food. Worthy of what? Worthy of a big bank account? Worthy of a mansion? Worthy of a jet? You have to have one of those or at least be grasping for one. Jesus, come on. Worthy of food? You can't be serious. Could this possibly be why Paul said, and having food and clothing, with these we shall be content? But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Yes, I know Paul said, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and a labor is worthy of his wages. This has to do with meeting the necessities of the minister, and not a green light to fleece the sheep. Let me tell you something. Anyone who uses the truth for selfish gain, making money off the blood of Christ and what he died for, I don't care if they do this through preaching, through songs, through books, through videos. It does not matter. 
In one sense, they're no better than Judas. In another sense, I believe they could be likened to those soldiers who cast lots for Jesus' robe before they nailed him to the cross. It's a mockery, and it's the very reason that Jesus himself made a whip turning over the tables of those marketing the things of God. He said that they made his father's house that was supposed to be a house of prayer, supposed to be a house of relationship and reverence, and turned it into a den of thieves. Remember, that was in regards to the selling of doves and possibly other animals for sacrifice. How much more the merchandising of the only begotten, the one who was rich and became poor, overcharging and merchandising the truth that Jesus spilt his blood for so that you can cut yourself a bigger slice at life? When there are Christians in other countries right now who may be imprisoned for standing for truth and don't even have a shirt to change? Back to Paul. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once again for my necessity. Does this sound like Paul is charging for the gospel or living as Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give? Does it sound like the church was charging one another when it says when you come together, one has a hymn, one has a song, or sing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Do you think they charge to sing to one another? These mainstream artists such as Chris Tomlin, Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, Kirk Franklin, you know, their base price, just the base price for them to start would be somewhere at seventy-five to 150000 Google says for a couple of these artists that also their speaking fee might be different than the fee shown for the cost to perform or to just appear. Popularity, career stage, along with current demand will cause fluctuations in their speaking price too. As I said, Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. If their musical talent is a gift that God has gifted them with for the service of his people, how could they fleece the sheep in order to gain advantage? How is this any different from modern day money changers that we call prosperity preachers in our day? God willing, I will be doing a future video on that topic. The Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. A lot of people listen to music without realizing they are being taught through the lyrics. Clearly here, Paul is writing to the Colossians and showing how through song, teaching is being administered. Knowingly or unknowingly, these artists have been used by the devil. Through their gift of music, he the devil has sent them forth as a Trojan horse into the church in order to bypass a rational viewpoint of submission to God's word. The word music comes from the word muse, and it has to do with being so absorbed in thought as to be unconsciously open mouth. That sounds like awestruck. That sounds like mesmerized. In this state of mind, the devil knows that people are susceptible because they are being moved by their emotions. He has them by the heart strings. He has created a perfect atmosphere to teach and insert falsehood. Remember, a lie is hardly recognized when it is surrounded by two truths. Now that I have exposed that music is one of the mainstream tools that is being used to teach, let's examine what is being taught. 
Let's examine a song from Sidewalk Prophets called You Love Me Anyway. It's like nothing in life that I've ever known. Yes, you love me anyway. Oh Lord, how you love me. I am the thorn in your crown, but you love me anyway. I am the sweat from your brow, but you love me anyway. I am the nail in your wrist, but you love me anyway. I am Judas' kiss, but you love me anyway. What's wrong with the lyrics in this song? First off, if they would have said, I was Judas' kiss, in past tense, instead of, I am Judas' kiss, using a present tense phrase, it might be tolerable and not so problematic. On top of this, why would they relate themselves to Judas anyways? When he committed suicide, in regards to what he did, Jesus said, Woe to that man whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Does that sound like he loves me anyway? The fact that they are proclaiming that he loves me anyway while remaining rebellious is so contrary to the Bible. I understand God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yet, does this mean that God loves the sinner in an acceptable way while he remains in willful sin? Is this an unconditional love to where he overlooks sin while they continue in it? Is that how the Bible teaches it? Is this not Satan's lie? Is this not what the devil taught from the beginning? What did he tell Eve when he questioned her about what God had said? Eve, recounting what God said in Genesis 3.3 says, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Did they physically die that day? No. They were separated from God and therefore spiritually died. Their spiritual death ultimately brought about their physical death because they were separated from the tree of life that was in the midst of the garden. Likewise, God didn't just love them anyway with a heart of acceptance without them repenting and turning away from their sin. Remember, they excused their sin and ultimately blamed God for their disobedience and therefore they were severed from God and the garden with no account of them ever being restored. There are several bands who are teaching this same old lie. It may not be the same phrase that the devil used on Eve, yet it is promoting the same deception. You can live how you want, in essence, do as thou wilt, because obedience has no bearing on your salvation. Let's examine another one by Matthew West called The God Who Stays. I used to hide every time I thought I'd let you down. I always thought I had to earn my way, but I'm learning you don't work that way. No, because somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. You're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. My shame can't separate. My guilt can't separate. My past can't separate. I'm yours forever. My sin can't separate. My scars can't separate. My failures can't separate. I'm yours forever. Again, this is just the devil's lie repeated. The Bible does not say that sin cannot separate you from God. They're taking this from Romans chapter 8, and clearly there it does not speak about anything in regards to sin. It talks about principalities, it talks about powers, mights, and dominions. These are all external things that will not separate you from God's love. But in no way is the Bible referring to sin can't separate. On the contrary, the Bible speaks about how sin does separate you from God. In Isaiah 59, Verses 1 and 2, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. 
but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. In line with this, Peter says, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. According to James and John in the New Testament, if you say you know Christ, love the world by not keeping his commandments, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. You're God's enemy. Does this sound like God loves you anyway while you presently have a heart of rebellion? Are the sidewalk prophets teaching this or are they teaching another gospel? James says that pure and undefiled religion is to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And I believe if James could have seen the future, he might say, pure and undefiled religion is to keep oneself unspotted from music like this that is teaching the devil's lie. early church believed that if they denied Jesus in the Colosseums facing lions, tigers, or being killed by gladiators, they would be denied by Christ before the Father. Now people think they can deny Jesus over the smallest of things, and it's no big deal. For some of these artists, it's just business as usual. If you are in the mainstream such as Lauren Daigle or Lecrae, you can bow out by saying you're not just a Christian artist. You do gospel rap music and you're here at the Grammys. So yeah. some barriers have already been broken down. Can you just talk about that process? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you know, first of all, it's just even even the labels. Like, I don't try to do gospel music. I'm not trying to be a gospel rapper. I'm a hip hop artist, you know what I'm saying? And so I just want to be honest about what I, what I believe in in my music. And so, um, you know, in the same way Kendrick is going to be honest in his music about his beliefs, I'm going to be honest about mine. And, and I just think if it's good, it's good. If it's good hip hop, it's good hip hop, and it should just be embraced. And that's really the, the aim for me. So I'm glad to be out here amongst people who do good music and who can appreciate good music and some of it may talk about God, some of it may not. Because so, okay, do you call yourself still a Christian artist even in the mainstream or what, what do you call yourself? I feel like those labels get put on you by other people. <laughs> well, I was reading an article. I read them like here and there. I gotta stay away sometimes, but then other times I'm like, indulge. And I was reading one and one of them's like Christian artists and the other one's just artists. So I think part of me is just artist because it encompasses everything. Sure. That's kind of how I see myself. Judas sold out for 30 shekels of silver, and let's be honest, some of these artists have much more to lose than that. Some even stoop as low as playing the card of ignorance by saying that they don't know if homosexuality is a sin. They've cloaked being a coward with a false humility of trying to put in the minds of the people that they're just a learner. feel that homosexuality is a sin. You know, I, I can't honestly answer on that. I have too many people that I love that they are homosexual. I don't know. I can't say one way or the other. I'm not God. So when yeah. people ask questions like that, that's what my go-to is. I just say read the Bible and find out for yourself. And when you find out, let me know, because I'm learning too. So if one of your kids, let's say one of your male sons, yeah, comes to you and 20, 23 years old and says, hey, dad, this is my husband. We're engaged. We're going to get married next month. And I want you to be in the wedding. Yeah. What would you say? My thing is like this. I don't like my brother's gay. You know what I'm saying? And so like, I don't I don't condemn him. I don't look down on him for him being attracted to the opposite sex. You know what I'm saying? That's that's something. Same that, sex. Yeah. Or the same sex. Excuse me. I don't condemn yeah. him. You know what I'm saying? Like, if anything, we'll, we will dialogue so that I can have a better understanding. Cause I don't profess to be like, I got this all figured out and I know the way this should be. Like, I'm trying to read the Bible. I'm trying to have conversations with people and I'm trying to understand, you know, the, the perspective, you know what I'm saying? And I, I feel like anybody who wants to come at 
a person negatively like if you was if you was a christian and you came to me negatively then it's like you're not giving me the grace and the space to be a learner you know what i mean help me you know give me the space and the grace to learn and and that's how that's how we move forward you know what i'm saying so you could point something out to me and say hey this is what it says lecrae you should know better you should know this well you know give me the grace and the space to to take my time and to understand the perspective on it and to understand why these people think it this way and it like that's that's the perspective i have i'm more of a learner and i and i give people the grace and the space as I'm processing and as I'm learning, um, you know, and just walk with people through that. You know what I mean? To just be, be a lifelong learner, man. They've glossed over the truth with a thin veneer of duplicity so that they could hit the stage of the Grammys and grab a Grammy. Worse than that, go on the Ellen DeGeneres' show to affirm the gay lifestyle even more in the eyes of the people. Not to mention, you also had Maverick City Music and Kirk Franklin winning a Grammy this year for Best Gospel Music. How they could set through Sam Smith's performance is nothing short of a display of their denial of Jesus Christ and their love for the honor of men. They're cowards. How is this anything like the early church and the world hating you as Jesus said they would? It's not. It's disgusting and detestable in God's eyes. And if you are a true believer, I'm sure it grieved you, if not made you nauseous. In John 15, 19, Jesus said, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The question is, how does the world view these artists? Are they viewed as the early church? Are they loving them or hating them? Are they rejecting or accepting them? This doesn't take great discernment to determine that they are well accepted by them and therefore they are of the world. If it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, has feathers and webbed feet and associates with ducks, we can certainly assume that they are also ducks. Some may say, are not these artists professing their faith in their lyrics? How are they denying Jesus? I suppose to answer that, we must ask ourselves, is confessing Jesus before men merely a declaration of words? In like manner, is denying him just a public denial of words? Or does it run deeper than that? How does the Bible portray it? We know that it must be more than just words because Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit, not by their confession. He said, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Yes, these artists worship with their mouths, yet their hearts are far from him. They are teaching another gospel not one where one must lose their life in order to have life as Jesus taught. No, a gospel where everything's been done for them in advance. James says even the demons believe and tremble. In contrast to this, the early church understood the scriptures and took them very seriously. Those who died for their faith didn't just conjure up some courage when pressure was put on them in the heat of the moment. No, 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 no. These men and women truly lost their life way before the test came, and when being challenged for their faith, they stood their ground. In Mark 8, 5, Jesus says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Notice how Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words. If you are ashamed of what he said and twist his words to accommodate your sinful lifestyle, you are denying him. He is the word made flesh. In the lyrics of some of these artists' songs, 
They have changed Christ's words in order for the message to be more palatable for the world. Therefore, unless they repent on the day of judgment, he will be ashamed of them. John said, He who says, I know him, speaking of Christ, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I don't know how it can get any clearer than that. In line with this, Jesus said, Not every one who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. These artists who are friends with the world, putting within their lyrics a message of compromise, denying Jesus Christ and what he taught, are cowards. They are spineless. They do not want to proclaim the truth because they know that it will affect their pocketbooks. It will affect how men view them and the world will hate them. Unless they are willing to repent and take a stance and be resisted by the world, Jesus Christ will be ashamed of them before his Father. Mercy Me also sings a song called Flawless. In the lyrics they sing, There's got to be more than going back and forth from doing right to doing wrong. Because we were taught that's who we are. Come on and get in line right behind me. You along with everybody thinking there's worth in what you do. Then like a hero who takes the stage, when we're on the edge of our seats saying it's too late, well... Let me introduce you to amazing grace. No matter the bumps, no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is, the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. If somebody has truly been saved by grace through faith, as Ephesians 2.8 speaks of, what is this amazing grace? Is grace just a cover for sin to where God the Father can't see you and only sees Jesus' righteousness while you remain in willful rebellion towards Him? Is that how the Bible defines grace? According to Matthew 1.21, it says, And she will bring forth a son, speaking of Mary, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Clearly here, salvation is from sin and not security in it. In Acts 3.26, Peter further confirms this by saying to the Jews, To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. This message wasn't only for the Jews, as Paul said in Acts 26.19-20, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works befitting repentance. This is not a dead work done outside of Christ, but a work done in response to Christ's command to lose your life in order to have life. Take note, the works Paul is referring to in Ephesians 2.9 is a work done apart from Christ. Hence it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that of not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. Clearly this work that Paul is speaking against is a work done without Christ, and therefore it would be without grace. Now if it is done by grace through faith, what is this amazing grace, and how does the Bible define it? Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 12 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Christ in his message is this amazing grace that has been sent into the world. He is the light the divine influence that shines into the heart of men in order to teach them to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, in order for them to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Not wait until you get your glorified body. If you don't live godly now, you won't have a glorified body. 
For the Bible says, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 29, probably written by Paul as well, says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. See again, the Bible defines grace as an empowering element one receives in order for them to be victorious. They receive this grace in order to serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. This is not what these music artists are teaching through their lyrics. They're teaching another gospel, a gospel in which everything has been done for them and that they don't have to do anything. What they fail to realize is that salvation isn't merely salvation from hell. Salvation is from sin and being saved from hell is a byproduct of being saved from sin. Again, this is not a work of your own outside of Christ as those Jews were trying to do. They were trying to sideline Christ and his message and enter in another way. There is no other way. Jesus Christ and his message is the only way to the Father, and it's a narrow and difficult way that few find. Is that not what Christ taught in Matthew chapter 7? Is that what you're being taught? Is that what these so-called Christian artists are teaching? Galatians 5.24 says those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. What happens if you don't do this? You're not Christ's. As I said, Christ taught one must lose their life in order to have life. Here's the question. Is losing your life you doing something? Come on, answer that. If you say yes, then Ephesians 2.9 isn't talking about that work. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, we are workers together with him, lest we receive the grace of God in vain. If you think the grace of God is one-sided and is a cover for sin and not a deliverance from sin, as the Bible portrays it as, you are those Jude talks about who have turned the grace of God into a license for immorality. Jude says that anyone who does this is condemned. Their condemnation was marked out long ago. Jesus is not a floor mat to wipe your willful rebellious heart and sinful walk off your life as you march through the pearly gates into heaven.